and here we are with the final episode of the season, Legends. Spoilers ahead, obviously, let's talk about it. Uh, we start off with the core open, where we see the uh, group taking out a ship, and then seeing, oh my god, there's <laughs> like an entire screen full of ships there. That's the core to open. Uh, much like in the uh, cartoon version, fantastic scene. Really, really well done. Uh, this one actually shows Sokka calling some shots and like strategizing a little bit and showing him slowly turning into a leader, which is initially good uh, if you ignore the fact that, and I have this as a point at some point uh, in my bullet points, so we might come back to this, but this entire season has been really about Sokka, uh, for Sokka anyway, uh, not having to be a warrior. That's the thing that he keeps coming back to. Like, his dad didn't think that he was maybe fit to be a warrior. The mechanist was like, hey, you might be a good engineer. And time after time again, the lesson for Sokka is you don't have to be a warrior. But, yeah, you kind of do, because otherwise you're an entirely different character. Uh, so, I don't really know where they're going with that. Uh, it didn't really end up with anything in this season, but going forward into a potential season two and three, I don't really know where they're taking that, and I'm a little bit worried. Now, that said, uh, Katara not just fighting for her own right to uh, be able to be a warrior in this battle, but also taking all the other female waterbenders uh, as soldiers with her to go confront Paku, like, okay, like, I fought you, you were kind of impressed by me, you, all your students were impressed by me, uh, I'm gonna fight. Fuck you. And she brings all of the other waterbenders with her. Uh, the female ones, anyway. Uh, that is a improvement. Uh, that is That makes that stance much more powerful. Because now Katara isn't just uh, saying, hey, I want to do this. She is actually taking up uh, the the role of like a, a figurehead for a much more uh, like deeply rooted societal uh, change. Which is, I think kind of what they were going for to begin with, uh, but now it actually does more explicitly show that, which is a good thing. I think that is a good thing. Uh, what really did weird me out, though, is the way they get Sokka and uh, Yue into the Spirit Oasis is because they need a place to heal Momo, because Momo gets fucking crushed by falling debris. For a second there, I'm not gonna lie, I really thought they were gonna kill off Momo just to save on CGI budget. Because, frankly, Momo has been very non-present in this season anyway. In the original show, Momo's always about and he's always, like, doing things, uh, just, just hanging out. And in this show, he's just not. He's, I think he's shown up in maybe, like, five shots in this entire season. Which makes sense because he's probably a nightmare to animate and he probably takes forever to render. So from a CG budget perspective, I can see why they don't want to have Momo around so much. So I actually believe it for a moment there when they were trying to kill him off because while he's cute, it's a little terrifying in live action, but while he's cute, uh, he also just generally doesn't add much to like the team or the story. So they, they could have killed him off and I would have been not pleased, but also I would have understood and I wouldn't have been that mad. Which brings us to UA in the Spirit Oasis. Uh, yeah, so I remember last episode when I said that there might be like a cool opportunity here for UA, uh, unlike the monster Godzilla thing that we see in the cartoon and also in this version. We'll talk about that a little bit. Not too much interesting happens there, uh, specifically for the live action version. Uh, but that one only ever pushes water because it is the ocean spirit. It is push. Uh, and Pool would be the moon. And since Yue can waterbend in this version and she gets uh, a piece of the moon spirit, I was like, it would be really, really nice if she could only pool water. And it seems like while healing Momo, uh, water is reverberating away from her hand, which very much implies a kind of pushing motion. So that just goes out the window right away. Later on, when she's uh, ready to sacrifice that part of the moon spirit back into uh, the koi fish, she also freezes Sokka's feet, which is mostly a pulling move, but it feels like she's also pushing the water really down to his feet uh, and then freezing it. So I don't think that my uh, potential theory there of that could be nice 
uh, to do. I don't think that ends up uh, being the case, which is a missed opportunity, but you know what? I kind of expected that. At least the, um, the giant Godzilla monster, which doesn't look as good in this version compared to the animation, I'm gonna uh, be honest there. It looks a lot more like just a random Godzilla uh, thing than it does a spirit monster based on a koi fish. It, it's it's a lot more generic, it's a lot less flashy. Uh, it also seems to take a lot more damage from the Fire Nation uh, artillery. In the cartoon, it just kind of ignores the fact that it's being hit, just because it is so far beyond anything that the Fire Nation Navy can throw at it. And here it actually like recoils and reacts to being hit, which might make for a more interesting action scene, to be fair, because you've got a little bit more like up and down in your tension. Um, so that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it was different. And that took me a little bit uh, by surprise because the the whole thing there would be that what they're fighting now is so far beyond what they could even imagine fighting that there's no point in even like trying to damage it. They're, they're keeping go in but there's really no point to it and seeing that like a handful of uh those fireballs can actually make an impact on it um it, it makes it significantly less intimidating uh which isn't that big a deal uh, i don't think during the episode i was a little annoyed by it but now thinking back when i'm talking about it i don't really think it's actually that big a deal uh because the flip side of that is the fact that it allows for a little bit more fluctuation in tension. And I think that is, in the end, the more important element. But let's roll back a little bit because uh, I want to talk about Zuko's per uh, perspective and just the whole Fire Nation perspective on this siege. Because the perspective from, like, Aang's point of view isn't that relevant. Like, we get one more scene where uh, Avatar Kurok's spirit shows up like, hey, there's, uh, there's my knife is close to here. Uh, somebody be killing spirits. Uh, do go take care of that. And that's pretty much the only addition there. Uh, the Fire Nation side of this siege actually makes a couple of interesting changes and or additions here that I really want to talk about. So first and foremost is when Zuko in the start of the episode leaves uh, for the mission. He leaves the uh, ship to go find Aang and we have more or less the same uh, dialogue here. Iroh doesn't do his little uh, proverb about uh, a, a squid or a octopus and a gnat and whatever it is in the original. And that's also, Iroh in this one, uh, in, in this show, generally also just isn't as much about throwing wisdoms at Zuko, which is a little bit of a shame. Uh, I, I really did miss that. The couple of times that he does it is like, in Pai Show, which kind of feels like a caricature of the character rather than it being an in-character moment for Iroh. Uh, but he and Zuko have a bit more of a moment because this season actually covered a little bit more about Iroh's backstory and uh, what happened with Lu Tan, that they can actually incorporate that into this scene, making this scene actually more effective at what it's trying to do than the original. Because in the original, this very scene is the very first time we get a vague hint about Iroh's backstory and the fact that he used to have a son, which he lost. That's the first time we hear it, is in this scene. So as such, it doesn't really have as much impact until your second watch through. In this show, we've already covered a lot of that ground, making this scene uh, work a lot better, in my opinion. Then they also use the airships, which is great because at this point in time those airships would have been at least in development if not ready so using that airship to bypass the battle and go right into the spirit oasis actually makes a lot of sense because the spirit oasis is at the very back even behind the castle of the northern water tribe so if Zhao can make it all the way there he can likely just win the battle to begin with at which point, why does he need to kill the moon spirits? Well, in this version of events, he's like, yeah, we cannot take the city by force. So we're in a bit of trouble. So we're going to take a different route with the airship, bypass the entire battlefield, and take the moon out as a factor in the equation that way. And then we can take the rest of the city. 
I also think this straight up from like a uh, battle strategy perspective is an improvement. This makes way more sense than what happens in the original. I feel like one thing that is going to divide opinions on this episode is the fact that the moon and the ocean spirits aren't just always hanging out in that oasis in this version of events. In this version, uh, they only cross into the mortal world one night a year. Unlike, I think it was called an ice moon. There's one special night a year where those spirits cross into the mortal realm just to feel what it's like to be mortal and then fuck off back into the spirit world for the rest of the year. Which I honestly kind of do like because why, why else would they just hang out in the mortal realm with that risk? Like one day a year just to experience it for a little bit to keep in touch with the mortal realm, that makes sense. Uh, but why the spirits themselves would just live in the mortal world was a little bit weird to me to begin with. Uh, initially in the cartoon I was like, ah, but maybe that's the reason that we do have a moon. But that's not how spirits work in Avatar. Uh, you, you can have a moon and then a moon spirit existing in the spirit world without it having to be in the physical world, right? We've talked about this a little bit in previous videos. So I, I think that this is also an improvement. Uh, there's a lot of things about this episode that I think are improvements. And I really do think that this is a pretty good episode. We're pretty 50-50 on me liking episodes in this series. Uh, but I think that this is among the episodes that I really, uh, really do like. One of the things, though, that made me just straight up laugh is when Zhao captures the moon spirit fish koi thing. Uh, he's like, Iroh, don't betray me now. You can be my right-hand man when I am Fire Lord. Uh, okay, Zhao thinks he can jump from commander to admiral to fire lord like that like taking out the moon what is what is that gonna do for his like chances to challenge ozai because if, if he can challenge ozai now and we can like usurp the throne through agni kai methods right why does he need to do all this shit and if he's not powerful enough to do that then why why does he think taking out the moon is going to do anything to to give him an advantage over ozai is he going to try to use his navy to attack the Fire Nation capital? Because I do feel that he's going to lose the support of the majority of his, his forces if he tries to do that. So I don't really know what his plan is there. Uh, I just thought it was really funny that he thought he was going to be able to pull that off because obviously that was never going to happen. So then the Moon Spirit dies. Uh, everything goes black and white, except it really doesn't. Uh, everything just goes low saturation, uh, but there still is saturation. Like, you can still see Aang's clothes, especially those, because those are very vibrant uh, clothes. They still are orange. Um, there's just less saturation, which makes the entire visual uh, language and the visual spectacle of that finale kind of fall flat. And I do understand, right? Because usually the only things that have color are um, the... Waterbending from the uh, Koizilla thing, U.S. Ice and the Firebending. And making the Firebending orange with everything around it being black and white is a lot easier in animation than it would be in this live action format. So just making everything low saturation and then um, just making like the fire the orange uh, higher saturation, that kind of works and everything lit up by the fire also becomes higher saturation as a result of that i understand uh why they did it this way because otherwise it would probably have been like a compositing nightmare to to make this happen but i also i don't know man this just doesn't quite work uh ua's eyes are still blue it's a bit of a shame that this is the first time that you can really see that they're blue probably if i go back and i really pay attention in the previous episode, they'll look blue. But to me, the entirety of the last episode, I was thinking, okay, so they probably just, like, didn't do that. These eyes look really, really brown to me. Uh, <laughs> very brown. Uh, but maybe they were blue and they were just not, like, properly shot um, with, with proper lighting to show that off or something. But that still is a shortcoming, I would argue. Uh, and it not contrasting against 
actual zero saturation also makes it work a little bit less well. Which brings us to uh, Zhao and Zuko. Uh, a couple of changes here, one of which is at the very end, uh, Zhao doesn't actually get uh, spirits kidnapped, he's just dead, <laughs> which actually I do prefer in, in some ways. Uh, I don't really mind either way. Um, I, I, I'm a little on the fence about it still, uh, actually. Because what happens is Zuko gets the opportunity to uh, to kill Zhao, and he doesn't do it, mirroring uh, the Agni Kai against his dad, and also uh, implementing the actual scene from their Agni Kai from the cartoon, where Zuko doesn't go through with it, he just punches a fire blast real close to where Zhao is, and then turns his back. Zhao gets up, tries to shoot uh, Zuko in the back, and Iroh jumps in. And Iroh jumping in is what absolutely, like, it burns Zhao to a crisp and then makes him fall into the water. If he was still alive, he would be drowning there. That still does a, uh, a good job at portraying what needs to be portrayed there. That said, with Zhao um, getting grabbed by the spirit in the cartoon, and Zuko then jumping up to help Zhao, it reinforces the fact that Zuko is a good guy. He's a good person. He is trying to help the person that he was actually actively fighting there. And Zhao then deciding not to take that help is also a strong character moment. And we don't get either of those uh, in this way. I don't think it's that big a deal um, for Zhao. I do think it steals something away from Zuko in a certain way as well. Because not killing your opponent and actively choosing to try to help your opponent from death are two very, very different things. And I think that this show has done a very poor job at portraying the fact that Zuko is a kind-hearted, good, nice person at heart, who has just been abused and has a lot of trauma built up that's making him act the way he is but that's not who he is at heart and this show in season one has done a piss poor job of portraying that side of Zuko every opportunity where the original show shows us that this show has failed to capture that and I've said this a million times throughout the entire uh, review series it really does feel like the creators of this show somehow missed the entire mark and the entire point of all of those scenes and the base of like Zuko's character conflict. Because otherwise you wouldn't consistently remove all of the scenes that show the most important thing about Zuko's character at this point in the show. Anyway, that's also where Zhao is like... You, you were never, like, the, the big deal. What, what you are is a motivation for Azula. That's all Ozai needs you for, is to motivate Azula. And that kind of plays into the theory that I had about how he's treating Azula and how he's talking about Zuko. I don't think this is well portrayed either. Uh, there's way too many scenes where Ozai legitimately seems like he's trying to teach Zuko a lesson and not just throwing him away even up until the very last scene where Oza gets the information that hey Zuko was at the siege of the north and um he might have been lost Oza at first is not necessarily happy about it he's like oh that kind of sucks but we've got Azula so it's fine but that's the point original Ozai would have been like finally we're rid of that guy <laughs> and this Ozai uh seems to not have that as part of his plan. That He wants Zuko to be alive and be open as one of the options uh, to still become heir to the throne, which I guess is politically speaking a more viable and smarter move to pull, uh, having multiple options. Like just if Zuko and Azula are both alive, you're just gonna get to pick the best one. So that makes a lot of sense, but it also really changes a lot about i don't care about the changing ozai's character but through that it also impacts zuko's uh, experience and his character arc as a result which is less than optimal also there's still no progression on azula's blue fire that showed in like one scene in one episode and nothing's come from it so far so maybe next season that'll be a thing but i so far nothing Leaving us with uh, one more bullet point that I have. Uh, I'm rambling on quite quickly because I've got so much to talk about. And that is uh, 
Iroh saying to Zuko when they're leaving the Northern Water Tribe, um, when Zuko says, I'm tired, Iroh says, take your rest. A man needs his rest, which is usually an opportunity to see some character growth within Zuko, because that same line is said at the start of the season uh, to him, at which point he ignores it. At the end of the season, having gone through all of that shit that he's just gone through, he takes Iroh up on the offer to take some rest. Now, I could be forgetting a scene, uh, but I don't think that the a man needs his rest uh, scene happens at the beginning of the season in this show, which, once again, misunderstands a part of the show. Do not take that at face value, though, because there is every chance in the world that I'm just forgetting that scene from the first episode, because that first episode of this show is very chaotic. It's very full with a lot of stuff. So there's there's a good chance that I'm forgetting about uh, that scene actually happening. But I'm fairly certain that it doesn't happen. And if that is actually the case, it is another one of uh, the things pointing toward the writers in this show not quite understanding a lot of things that they're using from the original show. And then we get a, well, it's not really a post credit scene, it's a post-episode pre credit scene, so it's like an epilogue uh, where we get teased with Sozin's Comet. So Sozin's Comet is going to come into play uh, sometime next season and then probably into uh, season three. It's just being postponed a little bit when we get introduced to it so that the time pressure can uh, still uh, be there but be somewhat more realistic on the actors just aging up uh which again i've talked about this before uh, that's fine that makes sense that's one of those changes that you know that's just due to the different medium uh there's nothing much you can do about that these kind of changes to the story need to be made in order for it to feel reasonable because you're not gonna say that half a year later in universe everybody looks like five years older so that i am fine with i'm glad that they're starting to introduce this now with just soon as a time frame so that they can still see like okay how long do we actually have uh in like the production timeline and what is that going to translate to in universe time so that's been my series of first episode uh, review, first impressions, whatever you want to call it. Uh, there might be like a season-wide uh, uh, like discussion video coming up in the next week or a couple of weeks as well about this entire season. We'll see uh, if we actually get around to uh, recording it. And of course there will be a new uh, Kingdom Hearts episode uh, for the actual podcast either just before or just after this uh, video goes live. So do check out the channel for that, and I'll see you back with, uh, with some more content, whatever it might be, soon.